Welcome to the British History Channel and to our latest historian interview. If you have been here before, thank you for coming back. And if this is your first time, welcome. My name is Philippa Lacey Brule, and today I'm speaking to Kate McCaffrey about her fascinating and illuminating finds within Anne Boleyn's Book of Hours, geeky pun intended, if you pick that up, what secrets that, um, that her research has revealed, and also her work as assistant curator at Hever Castle. Kate is a historian and, as I mentioned, assistant curator at Anne Boleyn's childhood home of Hever Castle in Kent. Her MA thesis focused on groundbreaking new evidence which she uncovered in Anne Boleyn's printed book of hours, one of two held at Hever Castle. She has co-curated the Becoming Anne Connections Culture Court exhibition, which has run throughout 2022 at Hever Castle and co-authored the book accompanying the exhibition called Becoming Anne, alongside fellow assistant curator, Dr. Owen Emerson. Members of my British History Patreon Club have submitted their own questions for Kate, which I will put to her after the main interview. And that section will make up the extended ad-free um, version of this episode, which members of my Patreon can access. If you are not already a patron, check out the details and all of the great history lover benefits you get, including putting your own questions to future guests at patreon.com forward slash British History. Now, let's get on to the interview. Kate, welcome and thank you so much for joining me today. So I've given everyone a, a bit of a brief introduction to you, but in your own words, can you explain a bit about yourself and your work? Yes, absolutely. So um, my name is Kate McCaffrey and I am an historian and an assistant curator at Anne Boleyn's childhood home of Hever Castle in Kent. Um, I've been a historical enthusiast for as long as I can remember, particularly interested in the histories of women uh, in the early modern period. And so I sort of specialised in that in my undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. And it was my postgraduate um, thesis on Anne Boleyn's Book of Hours that we hold at Hever that sort of catapulted me into this field um, and into heritage, which is always a world that I'd wanted to be a part of. And so to be working at Hever now and being an exciting part of some wonderful projects we have going forward with exhibitions um, and other things that will be revealed soon um, is a really, really wonderful experience. So I'm very grateful to, to be where I am. Yeah, you have got one of the best offices, I think, in the country. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So your discovery of these previously sort of unnoticed um, inscriptions within the printed book um, of mm -hmm. hours of Anne's, and we'll come back to explain exactly why we distinguish that, that it's the printed one in a moment. And it's held and displayed at Hever Castle. So anyone who's been in, in one of into Hever Castle see in the Books of Hours rooms, you have the, the two Books of Hours in there, but it caused huge excitement in the Tudor world. So I'm very excited to be able to talk to you about it today, delve into it a little bit deeper with you and maybe a little bit about your work at the castle as well, if that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah, it's my favourite thing to talk about. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. So, well, let's go back to the beginning. So, as I said, many people who visited um, Hever will be aware um, of the Anne Boleyn connection and we'll know that about these two books of hours which are on display but can you tell us a bit more about the particular book that you looked at for your thesis please? Yes so my my thesis focused on the smaller of the two books of hours which is um, also the least uh, assuming book it's probably the least famous book compared to our glorious manuscript um, it's actually one that was introduced to me by our wonderful head curator, Alison Palmer, when she uh, let me handle the books for the first time. She introduced the smaller one as the boring book of hours, <laughs> affectionately known, obviously, as the boring one. But um, it really is one that's not had um, sort of as much attention um, as the others have or as other, and as other books have. Um, so that was very much something that drew me to it. I think that it hadn't really been studied before. Um, and it's it's been found in my research to have been made in the year 1527, so produced in 1527 for um, release and uh, dissemination in 1528. So it's a really sort of pivotal point at the, the English court at this time that this book is being um, made and, and um, spread around. Um, it was made in Paris by um, a very prolific French printer, Germain Hardouin, 
Um, he ran a, a workshop with his brother Gilles, who um, preceded him, uh, and Hadwan, um, Jaman Hadwan, took over sort of mid 1520s. And this is where we see his influence um, starting to spread through the sort of the second quarter of the 16th century. He printed prolifically for all around Europe, but this was his first ever printing for an English audience, um, which is quite significant. So uh, this is a book that was made with use of serum, which is um, the Salisbury Rites um, in Latin. So it means that it was printed specifically for an English audience. Um, and the story of sort of how it came to Anne is one that I'm still um, working on and still researching, and it takes me in new directions all the time. But it is... Um, it's possible that um, it was perhaps a gift from um, someone at court. It was either a gift from someone at court for a group of people at court, because we know that several people at the English court at that time owned a copy of this same printing. Uh, or it was um, a case of people heard that Hardwan was producing these books and they sort of signed themselves up for a copy. Um, I can delve in more into that, I'm sure, as we go through. Because would these have been made to order in that way? Yes. Yeah, so what's really interesting about these printings is obviously printed books were produced en masse in a batch um, as opposed to manuscripts, which were much more easily personalised. Um, but these printed books um, were, were also personalised. They have different illuminations, different illustrations and decoration across all of the copies that I've looked at so far. So although the, the text itself was printed en masse, they have then been personalised um, for individual audiences after production, which is really interesting. Right. So there'd be sort of a basic, mm -hmm. excuse the term, but book printed and then additional bits added. Definitely. In the same print shop or would that bit happen elsewhere or is that something that it's not um, clear about? Yeah, so actually Hadwan himself was also registered with the Guild of Illuminators. So he wasn't just a printer, he was also an illuminator. So I think it's very, um, very likely that the books were all illuminated under his his workshop as well, not by him specifically, obviously, but by mm. under his eye. Um, so I think they were, would have been printed and illuminated together in Paris, uh, but with the knowledge of the intended individual audience, because um, that's where we really see sort of specifics between Anne's copy and other copies um, that seem quite targeted. Do we have any idea how many copies came out of that workshop? Oh, for this specific printing? Mm, or, yeah. Um, yeah, I found maybe about seven or eight so far that still exist today. Obviously, there would have been a lot more uh, back then. Usually, uh, printings were, were printed in a batch of maybe 50 to 100, depending on kind of um, how many people they were intended for. Because this was his first kind of delving into the English market, it's, it's possible that he printed less uh, the first time. Um, so maybe more around the 20 mark. Um, but but there's about eight that survive today, but I'd love to find more. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially if they're all personalised. and Exactly. That would be amazing. I'm just imagining sort of a, a workshop of, 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 of illuminators sitting there. It could yeah. have taken ages. I mean, these are, how many pages are in, a, in one of these books? So in, in this one, there's about 120 um, sort of, I'd say about A5 almost today, slightly smaller than an A5 page. And um, every page is illuminated or um every not every page every page has illuminated initials. Um so just at the start of sentences and also has page bordering. Um but the actual illustrations, um, so illuminations of biblical scenes are perhaps once every five or six pages. Um it's sort of a bit more scattered, but but they, there's always a, a full-size miniature at the beginning of each new section of the book. So they are still very they're they're real works of craftsmanship. I wonder how, do you, have we any idea how long it would take to complete one At least one book? a year, I think, from, from start to finish in terms of the, the printing process itself would be um, fairly fast. Um, but then the decoration, particularly with, this seems to be with the knowledge of different decoration for different people, um, mm. that would certainly have, have taken longer. Um, so we know that they were they were disseminated in 1528 because the calendar at the start of the book starts um, for 1528 for the year. Uh, but that certainly means that they were produced at least in 1527. So they had a deadline. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, they had to they had to make it um, for the start of the calendar. So, yeah. I mean, that shows just how incredibly precious these objects were. They might not be handscribed copies, but they're still incredibly expensive, presumably, Absolutely. and 
precious yes. to the people who had them. Yeah, I think that's a real, really important point because it's it's quite a misconception. I think that printed books were cheap, um, mm. and they were certainly cheaper than manuscripts, um, but they could still be produced to a really high quality, like these ones were. Um, that that meant they would have been very expensive. And there's several indicators across this specific book that show us that this one was intended for a very wealthy uh, English clientele. Um, you know, it was printed on parchment, not on paper, which is, first of all, a, a big distinction. That would have been a lot more expensive. Parchment's obviously what manuscripts were made on. Um, we have at this point in print culture a kind of emulation towards manuscript culture. So printed books are trying to be what manuscripts are, but for a slightly more reasonable price. Um, but we see that, again, through the hand decorations. You know, cheaper printings would not have been hand painted. They just would have had uh, maybe a stamp put on them and then they would have been sent off. Uh, but these were hand painted individually. You can see the differences across um, all the copies. Um, and again, the fact that, that Hardwan himself was producing these books has, has had a prolific reputation. So again, it suggests that these were intended for a, a very elite clientele. Mm, interesting. So what made you, uh, you may have alluded to it already, but what made you choose this book to look at for your thesis and had you any like we obviously we'll come back to what you did find but what were you hoping to find gosh I think so I actually initially reached out to um Alison at Heva to see if I could work with the books for an essay I was writing for my for my master's I, I hadn't even thought forward to my thesis yet um and she she let me come in and, and work with them which is just the biggest privilege um, because she'd known me from when I used to work there. Um, and so she let me get my hands on these books. And again, at first, we looked through the manuscript first. That was the sort of one that we were first drawn drawn to. And there's so much there that, that I will be researching at some point. But it was when we turned to the printed book, um, I sort of immediately fell a bit in love with it. I think it's sort of so small and unassuming from the outside. Um, it's just got this kind of plain brown leather binding um, compared to the manuscript which is much more opulent and it's very small and it just felt immediately holding it um, like it was very personal um, and then obviously it's it sort of has become the whole don't judge a book by its cover <laughs> um, spiel because once I looked inside I really stumbled across it was it was a sort of serendipitous moment really these um these erased inscriptions um, and once I once I realized there was something there that that nobody had, had realized was there before, that was absolutely for me. I was like, this is way beyond an essay. This is going to be my whole thesis. <laughs> and I begged Alison to come back multiple times to look at them. And I was able to just before the pandemic, actually. So it was useful that I managed to get in there uh, yeah. before the lockdowns. So before we go on, I suppose we should explain what a book of hours actually mm -hmm. was, if you don't mind. Yes. So a book of hours um, it's perhaps best described as a sort of Catholic um, scriptural prayer book. Um, so it was a kind of book that would govern um, everyday life, really, for people. Um, it was called a book of hours because uh, it was based around the devotional hours of the day that were outlined by the church. So you had matins, louds, prime, terse, sext, nuns, uh, vespers, and compline. And so these were all um, sort of set eight hours of the day that people would say prayers. And it was based around the kind of monastic community. Um, everyday people in the early modern period would perhaps not have been so strict with saying it at every single one of those hours throughout the day. They didn't have time. Yeah, they wouldn't have had time, exactly. It was more a ruling for religious communities, but it still did very much govern their kind of every day. Um, you know, when they rose in the morning, they would say their prayers, they would say them with meals, they would say them in the evening. Um, and so that's really what these books of hours were, were made for. It was to make that kind of monastic religious um, engagement more accessible for everyday people. Um, but what's interesting about them is that they were, uh, yeah, classically Catholic texts. Um, they were written primarily in Latin, um, sometimes with the vernacular. And interestingly, this printed book that I worked with does have English prayers in it, um, which is quite significant. But um, yes, they were, they were very customizable texts, both in terms of people requesting additions on production or people writing things in afterwards. They're fabulous examples for historians today 
of almost a modern day diary because it did have a calendar at the start of every of every book. People would scribble in things that happened on certain days. Um, there's a fabulous one of my favourites at the British Library is the Beaufort Hours, which was Margaret Beaufort's, and she's written in all the dates of her son Henry the Seventh um, coming to the throne and winning the Battle of Bosworth, and it just becomes this really intimate insight, which is fabulous. So that was a usual thing uh, that, that people would interact with these these books by writing in them. They would have them with them all the time. Yes, yes. So this kind of interaction with them um, was very popular and it became more popular across sort of the late medieval and then start of the early modern period. Um, these books, lots of historians today have sort of identified books of ours as the first popular book of the medieval era. They really sort of spread in popularity at this point. Um, they sort of faded out of production in Elizabeth's reign later in the 16th century, but before then they were really um, used very heavily and seem to have had a particular relationship with women as well. Um, it seems to have been a, a very sort of appropriate outlet for female engagement with religion and also for female literacy. Um, you know, women weren't encouraged to read novels or anything that was thought was to, to be too intellectual. They were sort of confined to very few texts um, that was deemed appropriate. And I think A Book of Hours was certainly one of those. So they really made them their own, I think, at this point. And that's where they became um, really interesting signs of domestic life, because this is mm -hmm. where women would record uh, things that were happening in their everyday lives. So would men have had books of hours as well? Or yes, it, yes. Yeah. Certainly men would have done as well. And we have lots of uh, wonderful books today that survive from, from men owning them. And um, we know that Henry VIII had a couple himself. Um, but there does just seem to be this kind of trend that's been acknowledged across time between women and books of ours. I think particularly through the, the interventions they made, men seem to, to primarily, if they owned a book of ours, if they were going to write in it, they'd sort of write, this book was mine and then sign their name and that would be it. But women would really engage with them more deeply and write these kind of details of their lives or record dates or recipes, uh, things of family importance. So it becomes that more intimate insight for women, I think. That's so fantastic. Yeah. It's that idea that you're the one who has to write the birthday cards. I know birthday cards yes, don't exist, yeah. but you know, you're, you're the one who's sort of responsible Recording. for remembering the birthdays. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, I love the idea of recipes being in, in yes. them as well. Yeah, there's a fabulous one again in the Beaufort Towers, which actually is available to look at online in the British Library digitised manuscripts section. So I'd recommend having a flick through at the start. And it includes, I think it's a recipe that she wrote down for a migraine and it involves pouring breast milk in your ear. So, oh. yeah. That's so something we've all got <laughs> access to. But <laughs> exactly. Mind. So there's some wacky ones. Um, but, but again, really, really fun insights, I think, into that time. Yes, absolutely. Well, I will put a link to to that below the sh in the show notes so that people can go and check that out. That would be fabulous. Um, and OK, so let's talk about the before we go on to the hidden inscriptions, let's talk about the famous one. So remind us what Anne Boleyn's inscription in this book said and what do you think she meant by it? Yes. So this is uh, her famous rhyming couplet is in this one. So it's the Remember me when you do pray that hope doth lead from day to day. And then she signed her name. Uh, annoyingly, a later binder has cut her signature across the bottom, which is very frustrating in this book. But it does still clearly say uh, Anne Boleyn. But this is um, a really interesting inscription, I think. It's been used uh, in sort of popular romantic history, I think, to um, suggest that Anne perhaps wrote this at the time of her death or before her execution. This kind of remember me when you pray, it seems like something that you'd write um, sort of when you're facing your own end. Um, and I think to an extent that's true, but I don't think it was before her execution. Um, she signs her name Anne Boleyn, which means that it's very likely that this inscription was before the end of 1529 when her father became the Earl of Wiltshire and she would have signed her name Anne Rochford and then later Anne Pembroke and then later you know Anne the Queen so this seems very much to be uh, something that's around uh, the 1528-1529 mark and what I like to think um, and that I'm still working on but is uh, my sort of working theory of when she wrote this is that um, because it does seem to have that kind of echo of facing your own end 
um, is perhaps that she wrote this in the summer of 1528 when she had the sweating sickness and she was incredibly, incredibly ill. Um, and obviously people were dying all around her. Um, and that was, <coughs> excuse me, that was when she came back to Hever. Um, she came back to Hever to recover and Henry obviously sent her one of his doctors and it's the exact kind of time that I can imagine she would be reflecting on um, something like that, on, on life and, and write an inscription like that. It was a sort of popular sentiment to write. People would often write inscriptions of remembrance in books of hours. It's a kind of popular theme. But what I particularly love about this one is, first of all, it's a rhyming couplet. So she just can't help but be a little bit snazzy with her words. <laughs> And secondly, it's it's a demand for remembrance. It's not a it's not a please may you remember me or I hope you think of me. It's she writes it in the imperative tone. So it's remember me. She's not asking. She's demanding, which I think is is a really fabulous insight into her character as well. So do you think that inscription was written for someone else to read? Yes, this is really interesting because a lot of other inscriptions you see in books of ours will have a specific dedication. It will say to this person or this person, um, but Anne's doesn't. So it's certain that she would have written in this book knowing that someone would read it. Perhaps not as many people as have read it today. I doubt she would have ever guessed yes. that. Um, but it's, she certainly would have written it with the knowledge of an audience. We just don't know the specific intended audience. Um, but at this point in her life, I think she's very aware in 1528, you know, of what she's on the precipice of uh, in terms of becoming queen. If she if she survives, you know, she knows that she's going to um, to rise to, to real heights of power. So I think she would have been aware that this is a significant inscription that, that people would have read. Um, and yes, from my later research, um, I found that who this book then later traveled to, which was a sort of network of her friends and allies, um, it could also have been a sort of more personal dedication to them. Because as as I understand it, and actually it was your co-assistant curator, Owen, who first told me about this, um, that books of ours were, were were handed down, especially yeah. down the female line. Yes. So you would have you would have known that someone would then use it. It Certainly. would be another intimate object for them. Yes, and a connection. Yes, they were certainly intergenerational, these books, um, and they were passed, again, often from woman to woman. And we see that through the provenance of, of Anne's hours, of both of them, I think, um, and of many others as well. Um, so, so she certainly would have known that that people were going to, to read it in the future. And, and if she had um, died in 1528, then it's likely that she would have bequeathed, had that bequeathed to someone specific um, or had that passed down and, and then it would have carried down um, that line. That's why we still have so many that survive today. It's brilliant that books of ours survive in so many, um, so much volume because they were kind of handed down personally um, instead of sort of given to sort of government bodies or, or royal bodies and, and maybe lost along the way. Um, they're very personal items. Yeah, they're, they're just amazing. So this um, I mean, your research, I've looked at the hidden inscriptions, which has given you a bit of an insight into the journey the book took. But before we get on to that, I wanted, well, I say hidden, but is it more accurate to say they were erased? Yes. And how, what method would have been used to erase them? And do you know why they would have been erased? Yes, yeah, really, yeah, really important question. I think that they certainly were erased rather than hidden. Um, they appeared to me initially to the naked eye to sort of just be kind of smudges almost on the page, on the bottom of the page. Um, I think they've been erased by water. Um, there were several ways to erase inscriptions. Um, the more violent would sort of be to scratch it out with something, um, which you would have seen disrupting the parchment, which we don't see in these books. Mm -hmm. um, they've been done sort of quite delicately. Um, and I think, yes, that it would have been water was a common way to kind of smudge the ink out. So they'd wet the page and then, and then rub the ink away sort of into the, um, into the parchment. And I think that's what we can see quite clearly in these inscriptions. In terms of why they would have been erased, I think my theory is that, that it was um, cleaned. There's, there's a trend in sort of late Victorian um, England to clean manuscripts before you sell them on. And so I think that, that it's likely that before this book was sold at auction, it was cleaned of all the inscriptions that weren't thought of as important. 
obviously Anne Boleyn's name was very recognisable, especially in the Victorian period. She has this renaissance. So they kept her inscription. But the other inscriptions in the book that aren't by necessarily recognisable names, I think they were um, cleaned in order to to make it more of a selling point um, when it was sold and to make it seem um, cleaner when it was sold, which is just horrendous to our um, sensibilities today, but but Mm. really was a bit of a trend um, at the time. I think this is something we've come to, though, isn't it, by sort of experience of looking back. Um, It's happened with buildings and paintings where someone has decided the best thing to do with that is to erase any of the follow on history that came with it and take it back to some point that they deemed the most important in that object or building's existence. And, And I think by them making those mistakes, we're very conscious of that now. And we don't do it so much, do we? Thank no, we don't. Goodness. No, goodness. We would never dream of doing something like that today. So it is, it's interesting to see how that's kind of changed across uh, the years as well. But yes, I think particularly in the Victorian period, they enjoyed um, sort of... Their enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they fiddled around a lot. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> overflowed. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It shouldn't have done. Yeah. So uh, how many inscriptions did you find? Um, so we obviously previously thought that there was only one um, there and I found four further inscriptions. So there's the five in total um, and it doesn't look like there's any signs of there being any others um, that were erased. Um, so it seems to just be the five within within the book now. And were you able to, sci- to decipher what all of them said? Not all of them, sadly. I've got partial transcriptions for all of them. Um, And most importantly, I've managed to um, decipher the names of the people who wrote the inscriptions, which is the most useful part in terms of tracing the book's provenance. Mm. Um, But some of them are very hard to read. One of them in particular, I can only get maybe about four words from. Um, But there's there's others that I have pretty much in full. There's one in particular um, by... Uh, an Elizabeth Shirley and I have that one in full um should I read it I can read yes it. please <laughs> so it's it reads um my known good niece Joanna require you to pray for your aunt with this here prayer and then it's her signature um Elizabeth Shirley um so that was the first one that I managed to to read and again you can see it's kind of following on of those themes of remembrance Mm. um and obviously was was written specifically to her niece um likely before she gifted it to her so again we kind of see those themes of of female um kinship across generations in the book of hours Mm. wow so uh so have you got Sorry, have I interrupted you? Have you got any others? Or oh yes, so so that's yeah. that's the one that I have in full. Um, and then the others are well, one is written by a Philippa Gage. That's the one that's hardest for me to um, decipher. I've got things like for and would and could, um, oh. but then the other one um, is written by John Gage, who who is um, Philippa Gage's uh, husband. And that one um, reads along the lines of um, pray to all the saints for trust and something, something, um, your father, John Gage. Um, So again, kind of signed this familial, you know, dedicated Mm. to your niece or your daughter. Um, And then the other one is written by a Mary West. Um, That's quite a clear signature at the end. Um, And the first line of that has been scrubbed out viciously. um, But the rest sort of says, remember me while you this prayer say, and then it's given to her power and ever shall be Mary West. Um, there's some interesting abbreviations she uses at the end, which I'm still sort of trying to figure out. Um, but it, it's what's brilliant is I have the names of all of the owners uh, or users of the book. Um, and again, yeah, you see those kind of themes of per- it's very personal dedications mm. um, and, and requests for remembrance. I'm just thinking about the time at which maybe these people were writing the inscriptions with, they've got someone in mind who they're writing it to, and presumably they're some, some time near, near to the end of their life. Yes. Yeah. And they're writing these. It's incredibly emotive. and It's very emotive. It's so poignant, uh, mm. the whole kind of process of this, I think it is, is a very uh, moving one. Um, and yes, it's sort of, it's in a way, I think, is a farewell, these inscriptions. Um, yeah, it's a sort of last note to, to, to people that they cared about, which is, yeah, a very kind of moving um, mm. sentiment. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, 
getting goosebumps. <laughs> so um, do you know, have you been able to uncover how each of these four people, how you link them to Anne? Yes, yeah, that was probably the part um, of my research that took the longest, um, because believe it or not, there were lots of Mary Wests around uh, in the 16th century. We didn't have a lot of different names to <laughs> no, play with. <laughs> it's really not very helpful. Um, but yes, I've managed to link, it was the first part of that process was linking um, the four of those inscriptions together, um, which came fairly quickly. Um, so obviously Philippa Gage and John Gage um, were married um, and Elizabeth Shirley was Philippa Gage's sister. Um, they were both born into the Guildford family of Cranbrook in Kent, um, the daughters of Sir Richard Guildford, um, who was prominent at court in under Henry VII and Henry VIII. Um, and their elder brother, Edward Guildford, um, was the uh, father of um, Jane, who later became Jane Dudley, who um, married into the Dudley family, who I think actually is the Jane, the Joanna, the Jane, who um, Elizabeth Shirley is, dedicates her inscription to. Um, and so we have these people all linked um, by kin, so brothers, sisters, and then Mary West um, was a niece of um, Elizabeth Shirley and Philippa Gage. So they're all um, kind of local Kentish nobles all around Hever, um, and around the Berlins uh, in the early to mid uh, 16th century. And, um, and their connection to Anne was something that took a little bit longer other than the kind of their, their closeness, their proximity. Um, but I think it comes through a woman named Elizabeth Hill. Um, she was the daughter of Elizabeth Shirley, who we know is written in the book. And Elizabeth Hill um, grew up in Braestead in Kent, which is surely only about seven, six or seven miles away from Heber, so very close. So the Berlins and, and the Hills would have, or she was uh, born Elizabeth Isley, that was her, her maiden name, would have been known to each other, certainly, um, if not friends. And later at court, Elizabeth marries um, the Richard Hill, the sergeant of the king's cellar. So we know that she's at court at the same time that Anne is in the early 1530s. And although the sergeant of the king's cellar is not necessarily the most um, prestigious position, it is one um, in which he would have been in contact with the king and, and Anne a lot. And we actually have some fabulous anecdotes um, of Anne and Henry playing, um, playing ball with um, Richard Hill. And uh, he ends up owing them quite a lot of money at the end. So we know that there's this kind of personal relationship um, there between the hills and between Anne. Um, and I think beyond that, obviously, the kind of proximity and closeness from childhood, um, I think, would have meant that, that Anne felt that she could trust Elizabeth Hill to, to pass this book on to. I think that's how the book um, makes its journey into Elizabeth Hill's extended family um, is because Anne especially at this time in, in the early 1530s. I mean, who does Anne really trust? Um, and I think we don't know much about Anne's female friendships, which is mm -hmm. very interesting. I think she's not often associated as having necessarily many female friends. She's sort of more known for her exploits with her male courtiers than her female courtiers. Um, but I think that's a really touching connection um, uh, between Elizabeth Hill and, and between Anne. And then quite, quite movingly as well, to carry that on a generation, actually Elizabeth Hill's daughter um, became a really close and trusted confidant of Anne's daughter, Elizabeth I. Um, and so we see that kind of, that friendship echoed um, in, in the relationship between their daughters, which is really wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. So would there have been an element of danger in keeping Anne's book? Definitely. I think certainly after her downfall, after her um, execution and her sort of widespread disgrace, when Henry is attempting, uh, you know, the systematic erasure of Anne from history, really, um, this is this would have been a dangerous time to own anything um, that involved Anne's image or Anne's name. That's why we have, you know, no real contemporary portraits of Anne surviving, because if there were any, they would have been um, either hidden away or destroyed. And so it's wonderful that we have um, this book that survived and I think it's absolutely testament to that sort of close-knit female community that this book passed through I think is a tale through them of, of real bravery and solidarity and also proof of, of a loyalty and a, and a personal friendship you know there must have been this personal connection for them to keep this book safe um, despite the danger. 
it's very interesting to think about the friendships actually because yeah how unless there's a personal diary or something how would we know the, the, the those dynamics we know the political dynamics we know and the religious dynamics which are kind of one and the same at this time but personal just purely personal relationships there's no reason why would they be in the records there's no exactly and I and I think that's important for us to not then assume that there weren't any mm. um it's important to assume as you say that that we just don't have record of them um, yeah. And I think that's why why things like this, items like this that have survived because of loyalty and, and connection to Anne or to other historical figures, I think that's why they they become imbued with this really important sense of, um, of fidelity and friendship. Mm. Yeah. So it's so something I hadn't really considered before the yeah. friendship thing, but it's... Yeah. Um, it could be really pivotal in, in, in everyone's relationship. Uh, sorry, everyone's lives, friendships are Absolutely. key and yet we look at family trees exactly when we're looking at history exactly. we, we don't think of the other connections sort of beyond family necessarily in history you know we think of romantic ones that were potential marriages or and we think of kinship but we don't necessarily think of of allyship or friendship which mm. is is really interesting because it is harder to grasp um but but things like this sort of give us that little glimpse um into those personal relationships which are really fascinating so do we know where presumably the, the trail goes cold as to the journey of this book so have mm. you any idea where it was in between the final of those people having it and it coming into heaver castle's possession yes so this is where the trail goes dark and it's so frustrating um but we have i think the last inscription i believe to be mary west's um i think that's probably maybe mid to late uh, 16th century. So really these inscriptions have only illuminated another 50 years perhaps of, of the book's history. Um, and then there is a good 400 years where yeah. it just goes dark. Quite well. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so we know that it comes back into Heaver's collection. It's purchased by William Waldorf Astor at some point before 1919. Um, there is a date on the back of the book, um, which suggests that perhaps it was purchased around 1912. Um, Astor buys Heaver in 1903 and then he spends sort of the next 20 years um, dedicated to bringing it back to Anne's memory. He's obsessed with Anne's story and he collects all these wonderful items that have a connection to Anne. And, and this is one of the, the key items that he gets. Um, our manuscript book of ours was bought much later in the 20th century, not by Astor, but this is, this is Astor's purchase. Right. Um, but very frustratingly, we have in the archive records that it came with an accompanying history, but that accompanying history has been lost. Um, so that I'm sure would answer so many questions. Oh, um, in that atrocious flood that there was. was it's, it? Yes, exactly. Yeah, the flood that we had in 68 destroyed, you know, the majority of our archives um, in the basement. And so, so we have so little remaining. But I remember coming across that and thinking, oh, my God, I'm literally so close. If that was there, that would just do all my work for me. Yeah. Um, but then I suppose I wouldn't have anything to do. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then we but, like a mystery really. exactly and the one so thing I, it did say sorry is that it was connected to is that it had um, been passed through members of the gage family that's what Astor had written in his notes we don't have anything else um obviously now i have the inscriptions too by members of the gage family um and you know the gages are still um at fell place in sussex that's their house um and so it's very possible that that is the family who who kept it safe i think the reason um, for it still surviving is that it was kept in a personal family collection, whether that was the gauges or whether that was elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it didn't, it would have popped up in records if it appeared in a museum or in a royal collection or in a public collection, it would appear in records, but there's literally nothing for it before the early 20th century. So that is something that I'm still working on. I'm tracing um, all potential sellers um, of where the book could have come from. Mm. Um, but that's a lengthy process. So that will be a sort of stay tuned. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we, we, we like we like an evolving story. Yes, absolutely. So I suppose if we don't know when Astor bought the book, do we know if he was inspired by buying the book to restore Heaver to... Yeah you know, Anne, what, is what he would have considered as close enough to, to what Anne would have noticed, or he was already obsessed with Anne and therefore got the book. 
I think it's I think it's a, a bit of both, probably. You know, I think he he buys Heaver because he wants to buy into this kind of English gentry. He wants to make himself into an English gentleman. He's come over from America and he says that America is no fit place for a gentleman anymore. That's what he says. So he wants to buy into this kind of English aristocracy, which is what he does by buying Heaver. And I think as he buys the estate, you know, he does commit a lot of time into um, understanding the history of the place. And obviously the Berlin's, you know, are probably the most famous part of Heaver's history. So he really delves into that. Um, but, you know, he seems to be obsessed with all things sort of Tudor and 16th century and um, before he kind of hones in his focus on on just Anne. Right. Um, so it's it's a very nice idea that, you know, he gets this book, he sees Anne's inscription, he becomes a bit obsessed by her story and, and then gathers all these other items. And um, because that, I think, is probably the most important Anne related item that he ever collected for the collection. Yeah, yeah. Well done, Asta. Yes, absolutely. We absolutely. should have got a portrait at the same time. <laughs> yes, exactly. Gosh, wouldn't that be nice? He was it must be one. It thing. must be in someone's. Oh, this is the thing. This is the thing with private collections. I think that that if my research can prove anything, it's that there are things there still surviving that we just don't know about or that are not on public record. I think so much still is that people might not even realise they have. You know, it might be in someone's attic somewhere that's been descended through generations they don't even know. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a brilliant glimpse into the kind of secrecy of, of things that, that still, I think, are, are out there and maybe one day we'll, we'll get a glimpse of one. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely stuff out there and hopefully it is that elusive yes. full-length portrait of Anne. Exactly. With a nice date in the corner to be Yeah, helped. oh yeah, it's got to be attributed <laughs> and an exact yeah. date. Yeah. That would be nice. So the book has a twin, doesn't it, which you discovered. Yeah. Do you want to tell people about that? Yes, yeah, so the book um, does have a twin. One of the other copies that was produced at the same time in this batch of, of printings by Hardwan um, is currently held uh, at the Morgan Library in New York. And that was once owned by none other than um, Anne's sort of greatest rival at this point um, and the Queen of England, so Catherine of Aragon, um, which is a really, really intriguing connection between these two women who we see as sort of so disparate at this point um, but really this is a point of real uh, unity I think a real moment of unity between these two um, at a time where in their personal lives um, you know it was just complete conflict and turmoil in 1527-1528 we have the tides at the English court are completely shifting um, and we have uh, Anne very much on the rise and Catherine very much on the wane we think it's definitely at some point in 1526 um, that Anne accepts Henry's proposal. So by the next couple of years, you know, the lines are really being established um, in terms of the trajectory of their uh, rise and fall. So for them to be sort of united in this moment by arguably the most peaceful of things, you know, a prayer book um, is a really interesting connection and one that that is um, has been really fabulous for me to explore. Yeah. So is there any insight into uh, were they given by the same person to each of them or perhaps one to the uh, presumably Catherine to Anne if it was either way around but yeah I think um d definitely it seems like again it's it's come from um either Catherine and Anne and whoever else hearing um that these books were being made and and sort of saying yes I'd like one of those with these editions or it's come as a gift, which I think is the most likely, is that they've been gifted as a batch to members of Catherine's household, you know, Catherine and members of her household. Um, we know that they weren't made specifically for women because the uh, Latin in the book is not uh, written in the female um, tense. So we, we know that they were written for men as well as women. But I think that absolutely could extend to um, Catherine and members of her household, obviously knowing that two of the most influential women in the English court at this time owned the same book. You know, that shows mm. us again the kind of destiny that these books were meant to have. They were made for the very elite of society. Um, and either it could, you know, potentially be a gift from Henry himself, um, which is a really attractive possibility, or again, even from Catherine herself. But whoever, whoever gifted these books knew um, who the individual audiences were going to be, because as Anne's has differences and compared to Catherine's has a uh, much more intricate decoration she has gold borders where Catherine's doesn't have any 
and has extra red and blue corner decoration around miniatures. Catherine doesn't have any and has inscribed borders with bits of prayers. Catherine doesn't have any. So there's real visual differences, um, which I think denote perhaps Anne's ambition at this point. Um, you know, she's in 1527-28, she has the same book as the Queen, but hers is decorated to a much more royal status than the Queen herself, which I think says a lot. Um, mm. But in Catherine's copy, we have, she's added in um, extra prayers. So at the start and end of Catherine's book, there are um, manuscript prayers, so handwritten prayers that have been added in, in Latin. Um, and these are the ones that have been really used. You can tell they've been really used in Catherine's copy, uh, which again, I think denotes to their religious uh, differences. Catherine obviously mm. being much more of a traditional Catholic, um, she was really engaging with those Latin prayers. But in Anne's book, the prayers that are, have been most engaged with are the English ones, which again, I think says a lot about their slight divides or significant divides in religion at this point. So those prayers in Catherine's, they're handwritten by in her hand, presumably. I don't think it's her hand. Um, um, it's likely true. that they've come either from another book and then they've been added in. Um, it's a very beautiful scribal hand. Um, right. It looks like a sort of standard scribal um, hand. Um, and unfortunately, Catherine hasn't written in her book. We know that it is Catherine's because a later owner has written in the book saying this book was once good Queen Catherine's. Um, and then they helpfully write out the whole provenance of the book and oh. who it went to and la di da. Um, and yeah, that's that was a, a very helpful sort of inscription. For yeah, me, if anyone someone had done that for you. I know, <laughs> like just a nice little tree at the back would have been yeah. nice. Um, Actually, the, the, the fact that Catherine had a copy adds a little more intrigue or questions in my head about the, the fact that there is English in there at all. Yes. Because it was that unusual to have English prayers so it, it wasn't as unusual as we might think. I right. thought it was unusual as well initially when I first um, looked at them. But there are examples of books of hours with the vernacular language in them. So whether that was um, French books of hours with French written in them, Italian with Italian written in them, etc. Um, it's, it's, it's more rare, I would say, for English books of hours to have English in them. Um, you know, Anne's other book of hours is completely in Latin. Um, but I think what's more significant necessarily than the presence of the English language is the way it's been interacted with. Mm. So again, in Catherine's, it's not, it's not been touched. You can tell, you know, she's, she's not really read that or engaged with that. She's stuck with her classic Latin prayers. But in Anne's book, um, there's wonderful signs of interaction around the English prayers, which show, you know, the pages have been turned down, the words have been rubbed, like they've, they've returned again and again to those kinds of prayers. So that's, I think, perhaps the most interesting part of it. Mm, that's lovely. That's such um, tactile evidence of, yes. of how someone's using a book and what was important to them. And Absolutely. I love that kind of haptic, tactile evidence. Is, is really wonderful. And there's a great sort of range of that you can see across books of hours. So it sounds like there's still a lot to find out about this book. Because so I was going to ask you if there's plans to look at the manuscript book, which I think you've already alluded to anyway, but it sounds like you've still got quite a bit that you <laughs> want to find out about this one first. Definitely. Yes, it's unfortunately one of those um, research topics, which I suppose most research topics are, but it it's, takes you down one rabbit hole that you don't even expect. And then you sort of neglect something that you were supposed to be looking for. Mm -hmm. And you have to go back to that. And it just sort of continues and continues. But um, definitely there's more much more to find about the printed books um, and I will be uh, finally I'm finally going through the very slow process of um, publishing my thesis um, in an academic journal article so that will be coming soon um, when I say soon it probably won't be for another year um, but that will be sort of the first step and I think in the process of me going back to my thesis and going through it all again I think I'm sure it will spark me off on something else and something else. Um, but then the manuscript absolutely is still is still very present in my mind and in what I want to do with it. Um, and, you know, we've made some interesting connections with it so far as well. Um, the manuscript itself has inscriptions by about nine other noble families of the time, um, including the St. Seymour family, the Parr family, uh, some very big names of the time have written in our manuscript. So that's oh, a kind yeah. of um, more obviously interesting story there as well to tell, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Lots to be done. <laughs> yeah, lots to be done. And interesting, back to the point we made before, or you made before about it being in dangerous to conceal anything that had been to do with Anne. And yet, of course, there was 
too. Books yes, and hours, exactly. and that's that's not the only books that belong to Anne which have managed to exist. Exactly, it's wonderful. We have about nine or so surviving books that were once Anne's um, or Anne and Henry's, depending on um, who you think owned King's MS Nine. Um, but I think that that yeah, it's definitely proof to whoever was holding on to them of this kind of personal connection and loyalty, which again is lovely to see that so many did survive. Um, although I wish that there were more. <laughs> mm, of course, there's never enough. <laughs> so I, I, I said at the very beginning, you know, this, this, your findings caused such interest in the Tudor, obviously Anne Boleyn fans, but the Tudor world. Has it been picked up by the wider history community or is this a particularly Tudor esque um <laughs> yeah excitement <laughs> um i think i was honestly really really shocked by the um wonderful response to my research when we sort of launched it initially last may um and yeah my you know i'd only just finished my ma at that point um and i had been working on this project for years and i had been sort of had to be really secretive about it because we knew we were on something a bit different so we had to keep it under wraps um so then when i sort of was able to, to tell people about it it was wonderful but it was also scary because i thought what if nobody cares as much as i care because it's been like just something that i've been working on um so yeah it's it so surprising but amazing to see a really widespread response i think obviously within the tudor community but also without you know, out extent of the, the um, Tudor community um, across the world of history and, and across the world. You know, I saw I saw um, people were sending me things of, you know, papers in Hungary printing about it or in Australia and, and lots in America and even in, you know, in Asia. And it was just amazing to see like, oh, my goodness, this like one little kind of discovery from from my end has like has reached a really wide global audience. And that's just something that still is very surreal to me. And um, yeah, I think my Twitter blew up like it never had before <laughs> <laughs> those first few days. Um, but it, it's wonderful to see that people can engage with this kind of story. Because I think what, what hits home for a lot of people is, is just the human element behind this story. And that's certainly what, what draws me into these books is not necessarily the material history of the book, but is, is the people behind it. Um, mm. And at its heart, I think there are just some very human stories of, again, of friendship and kinship and loyalty and bravery. And I think that's something that's that can, a lot of people can relate to and a lot of people are interested in, which is is wonderful. Yeah, that must have felt very surreal. Can you <laughs> very think? surreal. I wonder if anyone's <laughs> interested. Oh, the whole world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it was amazing. My, my mum's collected lots of newspaper clips oh. things, so she's uh, she's thrilled with that. But but yeah, it was it was very surreal. But is is again just so amazing. And such a privilege it's been really a privilege of my life to be able to work with these books and be the person to kind of bring their stories forward wonderful well now you um you co-curated the becoming anne exhibition um at heaver as well as I, I must plug the book i think you can still you can get this from the heaver shop i think yes so kate um and owen emerson wrote this book which accompanies the um the exhibition which has been running this year Mm -hmm. it's yeah. coming to its end now I it's think it's coming to it? its end 7th of November it comes to its end this one so Before were you able to it. incorporate your findings into that um I was a little bit I was a little bit um but we were primarily my findings actually exciting they're going to be really debuted in our exhibition for next year which will be launching in February um the 7th of February I think but it will be early February, that will be confirmed. Um, and that will be running again for the whole of next year. And that's the one that we were initially going to have on this year. Um, but we realised we wanted to take more time to make it um, more special, to be the sort of real launch of, of different parts of my research. Um, so that's something that I've been working on for a long time now and I'm very excited about. Um, we, you know, we, we dabbled in a little bit of my books of ours research in our Becoming Anne book. Um, but our next exhibition will be will be the one where um, my, my research will be published um, in print for the first time um, in the book. So that's exciting. So what's the title of that exhibition then? Have you got that sorted yet? Yeah, so the, the title for next year's exhibition, and this is an exclusive, is um, Catherine and Anne, Rivals, Queen's Mothers. That is going to be the exhibition title. So wonderful. focusing, yeah, all on Catherine and Anne, um, you know, through the lens of their books of hours, 
um, and through the lens of my research. And we're going to be trying to look at what united them as well as divided them um, and, you know, challenge some of those traditional narratives that have them pitted against one another all the time. Um, so that's it's something that I'm really excited about. That sounds so interesting. I love anything that says, oh, let's just not accept exactly the same old story let's actually think about this for a bit longer and look what else might be happening exactly that's absolutely what we're going to try and do i think it's about time to be honest that we we challenge some of those older narratives so hopefully it'll be um, something people can get behind it's quite that traditional one though isn't it that ex-wives and wives and whatever must be at loggerheads exactly exactly it's like let's appreciate you know how much they had in common um you know at the very baseline they're very mercurial husband so <laughs> there's all sorts um all sorts that we we're going to delve into and some really exciting loan objects on display and um, that we've been working really hard to secure so there'll be some big um big attraction items i think for people to want to see fantastic so i will of course be there a few times <laughs> on tour next year so i'm yes, very excited exactly. to be able to yes. bring the groups so, there'll be a lot there for you to see i think wonderful so um, we're going to move on to the questions that have come in from patrons, a member of my uh, members of my Patreon um, group, in a moment. But we're going to cut the main interview uh, before we go on to that. So before we do, can you tell people where they can find you, where they can um, access your work, etc.? Mm-hmm. Anything, anything you want to tell them about where they can find you? Of course. So my Twitter handle is at Kate E McCaffrey. Um, and my Instagram is Kate E. McCaffrey Historian. Um, I post lots of my various historical exploits on both of those. So definitely follow along. You have um, a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Me and Owen, particularly at Heva, you know, we get up to all sorts. Um, so there's all sorts of exploits there. And my um, my website is linked in my Twitter bio. That's kateemccaffrey.wordpress.com. And that has um, some more in-depth explanations of my research, Um, although I do need to update that. It's been a little while since I last posted. Um, But yeah, they're my socials to follow me on. Fantastic. And there will be details on there, presumably, when your paper is published about where people might be able to read that. Exactly. Yes. Twitter and Instagram, you know, that's where I'll be posting updates of my own personal research and my work with Heva and the exhibitions. So definitely stay tuned. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. 